Hello and welcome to my show, Shuvra Deb with you, with me, your host, Shuvra Deb. In this show, I will be discussing mental health with the aim of raising mental health awareness in our community and in society as a whole. The genesis of the show is my own pivotal life-changing experience of being in a Category 5 hurricane back in 2017. That experience led me to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. I am hosting this show in order to let you know that you are not alone if something life-changing has happened to you from which you are struggling to heal. Shuvra Deb with you focuses on a range of topics relevant to mental health and to raising awareness of issues surrounding mental health. Hello everyone, welcome back to my show, Shuvra Deb with you. I'm so grateful that you have tuned in to listen to my show and to hear what I want to talk to you about this week. For those of you tuning in regularly, you'll know that the aim of this show is to raise awareness around the topic of mental health. And I approach that in every sense of the term mental health. For those of us suffering from trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, or any other form of mental illness or mental health issue, I hope that the topics I discuss and what I say on these shows help you. For those of us wanting simply to look after our mental health on a day-to-day -day basis and the way that many of us look after our physical health by going to the gym or eating a healthy, balanced diet, my intention is for my show to be relevant to you and also to resonate with you. And I love hearing what you guys have to say about my discussion topics. So please, please do reach out to me with your comments, your questions, any feedback. If there's something that you'd like to hear me talk about, then please, please just let me know. You can get me on my email, which is shuvradeb82 at gmail.com. That's shuvradeb82 at gmail.com, spelt S-H-U-V-R-A-D-E-B-8-2, the numbers, at gmail.com. Whilst this show and all of my shows are about mental health, I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not professionally qualified in this field. If you do need to seek professional help, then I wholeheartedly encourage you to do that. And we have a good number of options here in the Cayman Islands where you can reach out to for support. And I'll run through those resources a little later on in the show. I feel like I covered a lot of ground on my last show, which was about a book called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. This book, I feel, is a little pocketbook guide for my spiritual and mental health to living my best life. And it comes from the teachings of the Toltec civilization, an ancient civilization from Mexico. The teachings brought to us by Ruiz contained in that book are to be impeccable with our word when we speak of ourselves, about ourselves, of and about others, to not take things said or done personally, to not make assumptions about anything that anyone says or does, and to always try our best in practicing those first three commitments, which Ruiz calls agreements. I also spoke about a toolkit that's contained in another book, a book called Chatter by Ethan Cross, he specializes in ways of taming the conscious mind, which is what the book's about. The toolkit in there provides ways in which we can turn our negative internal self-talk into positive internal chatter. If those are topics that sound interesting to you and you missed my last show or any of my previous shows and would like to have a listen, then please do listen out for the podcast details, which I'll be launching very, very soon now. We are ever closer. In my last few shows, I've talked about practices and techniques that are available to all of us in things such as stress management, finding your life's true purpose and combating our internal negative self-talk. And I've spoken about these topics with a focus on what we can all do to take care of our mental health, to practice self-care and to empower ourselves to have a more positive outlook on life, even when the unexpected may happen to us. All of which I hope helps you, the listener, to have a better quality of life and a good experience from this wonderful, precious life that we all have. For those of you who tuned into my first show, I'm so grateful to you for having listened to that. You'll recall there that I talked about the genesis of this show. The genesis of this show is my personal mental health journey of suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of experiencing Hurricane Irma back in 2017 in the British Virgin Islands. 
In that show, I spoke about my own trauma in a very direct way. I talk about, talked about how for around about a year or so, I didn't even know that I had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And in that time, I was suffering from some very typical symptoms of PTSD, including, for example, seemingly overreacting to things that were happening around me. I talked about how after the hurricane, we had evacuated to Puerto Rico, a neighboring island in the Eastern Caribbean, and we were staying in a hotel. On one of those days, I got locked out of my hotel room due to the key card not working. I was so overwhelmed by a panic and anxiety reaction to this that I ended up collapsed on the floor outside my room in a helpless heap and sobbing. It was so bad that the person who worked at the hotel who was helping me had to go and find one of my friends who had to come and help to calm me down. I don't think any of us in that scenario knew what was going on. None of us knew, including me, why I was collapsed in a heap on the floor, sobbing, all because a simple key card to a room wasn't working. I then went on to discover the science behind why all of that had happened to me, why my friend and the guy at the hotel had got caught up in the middle of all of that. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, in his most fascinating book, which I highly recommend, it's called The Body Keeps the Score, explains the science behind these types of reactions. He tells us about the amygdala, which is our brain's regulator of our emotional and behavioral responses to events outside of us, and is also the brain's response center to events outside of us. Referring to the amygdala as the brain's smoke detector, Dr. van der Kolk says, if the amygdala is the smoke detector in the brain, Think of the frontal lobes located directly above our eyes as the watchtower, offering a view of the scene from on high. So the amygdala responds and regulates. The frontal lobes keep a lookout, taking in what is going on outside of us, giving an aerial or bird's eye view of what is going on around us. Dr. van der Kolk continues, the amygdala doesn't make judgments. It just gets you ready to fight back or escape even before the frontal lobes get a chance to weigh in with their assessment. As long as you are not too upset, your frontal lobes can restore your balance by helping you realize that you are responding to a false alarm and abort the stress response. However, for PTSD sufferers, Dr. van der Kolk states, the critical balance between the amygdala, or the smoke detector, and the frontal lobes, or the watchtower, shifts radically which makes it much harder to control emotions and impulses. In this condition, the inhibitory capacities of the frontal lobe break down and people take leave of their senses. They may startle in response to any loud sound, become enraged by small frustrations or freeze when somebody touches them. As what happened with me, the PTSD sufferer may start to display all kinds of strange and unusual behaviors that may be considered to be completely out of their ordinary character. So with that in mind, today I wanna to talk about the issue of trauma and PTSD and look a bit more at this. And in that context, today I wanna to look at how as someone who is close to someone that has been through something traumatic who may be suffering from PTSD, how we can start to be there for them to help maybe identify some of the symptoms of PTSD that they may be displaying and how we can start to support them. In listening to this show, I want you to remember that whilst I wholeheartedly encourage you to be there for your friends and relatives who might be going through something, they should also be advised to seek professional help if that's what's needed for them, whether that's through the services of a psychologist or psychiatrist, or through the assistance of another relevant professional. At the same time, I do encourage you as the friend or relative of someone suffering trauma or PTSD or any other mental health issue to be on the lookout for your own mental health, to look after yourself. If being there for someone else is becoming too much for you, then please, please seek out professional guidance for yourself. We all need to be listened to, we all need to be heard and we all need to be supported. And there are great resources here on island in the Cayman Islands to help you. Infinite Mind Care provides counselling services and they can be reached on 926 0882.
The Alex Panton Foundation offers support to people up to the age of 30 and their information is on their website, alexpantonfoundation.ky. Loud Silent Voices provides mental health support and their number is 922-3847 and their email is info at lsv.support. This show arises from my very direct experience of how the people around me helped me to recover from the Hurricane Irma experience. So how did the people around me help? Well, firstly, none of them knew I had PTSD. I didn't know I had PTSD, so how on earth could they know? And sadly, the knowledge around mental health in society at large is very lacking in my view. We're not taught at school or at any time after that what the typical signs might be when someone is in mental distress and they need help. Physical distress, on the other hand, is something that as a society we are much more aware of. Almost all of us have had or will have first aid training at some point in our lives. Most of us will have seen adverts for identifying when someone is having a heart attack or a stroke. And we all know to dial 911 if someone is seriously physically injured. But on the mental health side of health, it's only when someone studies medicine or psychology or another relevant discipline that we learn about these things. Or worse, it's only when we or someone close to us has a breakdown or a mental illness, or worse, that we realise that they need help or that they needed help. The second main thing to say on this is that as the person supporting the person with PTSD, which is the topic I'm looking at today, that is an overwhelming place to be in. Being confronted by some of the behaviours that the person suffering PTSD is likely to display can be heartbreaking at worst and confusing at best. The heartbreaking element can be where the person suffering PTSD can become withdrawn and that will likely lead to them being less affectionate, less communicative and less interested in life, less interested in displaying physical signs of affection. They may become less interested in you and in your life and what you may be going through. And all of that is because, at its very simplest, the person suffering PTSD is stuck. They are stuck in their own minds, trapped inside the illness, making it difficult for them, even impossible, to show affection, to communicate, or to participate in life as they perhaps once used to. On my first show, I described one of the ways that this sense of being stuck inside my own mind presented itself to me. I would be out with friends, trying to live a normal life, whatever normal is, trying to participate in life, I suppose. And if I was in a group of people where perhaps I didn't know all of them, or maybe knew some of them peripherally, and it became known that I had just been through Hurricane Irma, which was still fairly, fairly topical at the time, some of those people would ask me questions about the storm, about the experience, about whether I was scared, whether I thought I was going to die, and of course the answers to all of those questions were resounding yeses. The experience was horrific beyond my wildest imagination. I was terrified experiencing a level of fear I had up to that point not known. And yes, yeah, I thought I was going to die, which is one of the worst feelings I've ever felt. So the way this being stuck in my mind aspect of the PTSD would present itself was that I'd be asked these questions and I would be unable to answer them, to say how it had really felt, how it had been. And whilst this was going on, I would have an almost out-of-body experience where the voices of the people asking the questions and the surrounding sounds of where we were would all start to become muffled inside my head. All I would be able to hear would be muffled voices and muffled sounds. And the physical experience would be a sensation or or feeling that I can best describe as having pins and needles inside my own head. It was as if I was inside a spinning vortex contained inside my own head of muffled voices and other sounds, and all the while physically feeling as though I had pins and needles inside my head. What was happening is that I was having a very, very public panic attack, except I didn't know that I was having a panic attack. I didn't know that my shallow breathing my elevated heartbeat, my inability to swallow because my throat had closed over and become tight. I didn't know that these were signs of a classic panic attack. So as a friend or relative of someone going through all of this, what are some of the other signs to look out for? 
One of the things that you may feel happening is that you may feel as though you are walking on eggshells around your loved one or your friend with PTSD. Not knowing how they will re react to something you say or do or to an event outside of both of you. You may feel like the person's character and personality have changed so much that you're living with a stranger or spending time with a stranger. You may feel unable to recognise this person, this person with whom you once may have had a very close bond and attachment. If this is happening, then the key thing to remember is that it can get better. Once it's been identified that the person you love is suffering from PTSD, and once that person seeks out treatment for their PTSD, things start to improve. And sometimes, once the improvements start, there's an upward trajectory and things improve dramatically and quickly. Another key thing to remember whilst all of this is going on is that none of their behaviours are anything personal to do with you. So, as a loved one of someone suffering with PTSD, we must remember not to take things personally, not to take anything that is said to us personally, and not to take personally any changes in the person's character or behaviour. If you have been able to identify that your friend or relative is suffering from PTSD, then no doubt you'll want to help them the best that you can. Helpguide.org is a website which provides a really good number of suggestions on how we can be there for someone suffering with PTSD. The most important thing to say in all of this, though, is you need to be sure that you are in a sufficiently strong place in your mental health to be able to be there for someone else. After all, a broken down car is incapable of towing another broken down car. So please, please ensure that you are in a good place yourself before putting yourself out there for someone else. So what are the tools to support someone with PTSD as suggested by helpguide.org? On my first show, I talked about how the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder can leave the sufferer feeling all sorts of things, including feeling ashamed for the feelings that they have. One of the reasons I withdrew and didn't talk initially about how I was feeling was because I felt shame for feeling sad, depressed, angry, for not being more grateful to be alive, especially when others around me quite rightly were saying how lucky I was to be alive after having gone through Hurricane Irma. So one of the things as a member of your friends or loved one support network that you can do is to let them know that you're there for them, but at the same time not to pressure them into talking about what happened that caused them the trauma and not to pressurise them to talk about what they're feeling. The pressure I sometimes felt in social situations to recount what had happened more often than not left me feeling worse. It was different, however, when it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a close friend where they were genuinely concerned and were providing a safe space for me to talk and to share. Allowing your loved one to talk about their experience if and when they're ready is a really, really powerful and empowering tool for them. Also, be prepared for the person to be talking about the same events that happened to them over and over in a repetitive manner. If this happens, this is the brain's way of processing what has happened to them and is actually something that is a part of the healing process. I remember as a child, I was around six, maybe seven years old, and I was with my parents. The three of us were in our family car and another driver smashed into my dad's side of the car, the driver's side, as we were turning out of a road. It was nothing serious in the end, but I clearly recall it all happening, even now. I remember seeing the car approach us and then hit us, and I remember feeling very, very worried about my dad, whose side of the car had been hit. This had happened, I think, on a Saturday. And then in school the following week, my parents must have told the school what had happened, I guess so the teachers could keep an eye on me. And I think my parents must have told my teachers because they had noticed changes in my behaviour. I recall that when my class teacher asked me how my weekend had been, I repeated over and over again what had happened with the car accident, recounting the events over and over, saying the same words over and over. In those moments, in some bizarre way, I somehow knew that that wasn't what I normally do, that wasn't my standard behaviour. And I think it was then that I realised that I'd been quite significantly affected by this accident, affected by having been so worried about my dad's safety. I don't remember now what happened after that, but I do recall feeling better in the days after. And perhaps it was that repetitive retelling of the story 
which in part helped my brain to process something which had clearly had a significant impact on me. Another tool to help your friend or loved one who is suffering with PTSD is to provide them with a secure and safe environment in which to live their lives. This may be easier said than done, of course, depending on the situation. Immediately after the hurricane, I went to be with family and friends. I was living with a friend on a small island off the UK. My friend, Sally French, shout out to you. Sally provided me with such a stable home and friendship that without that, I think I would have totally crumbled. I was so fortunate for those few months of my life living there with my friend. All of her friends were so kind, friendly, inviting and sensitive. Maybe in some way they could see what a wreck I was and they were so warm and understanding and they all showed me so much grace. As humans, we all need a safe place in which to live, a place to retreat where we know we're safe, supported and loved. So the takeaway from this is that for someone who has experienced trauma and is suffering PTSD, particularly if that trauma event involved losing their home, livelihood, and possessions as what happened to many of us after Hurricane Irma, then the need for that person to have a safe space in which to retreat, which to call home, is so, so important. The need for a sense of safety goes beyond having a physical home, which of course is crucial. My friend and former university lecturer, Dr. Ishla Singh, now practices as a psychotherapist in the UK. She posted something from Dr. Gabor Mate recently on her social media. The quote from Dr. Mate, which Dr. Singh refers to, is Safety is not the absence of threat. It is the presence of connection. I'll say that again. Safety is not the absence of threat. It is the presence of connection. So, as part of providing a safe and secure environment for your loved one, for your friend, maintaining an emotional connection with them is so important. By maintaining that emotional connection with them, you're letting them know that they matter, that they're seen, that they're heard, and that they are not alone. For the traumatized person, it's also important to gradually start to build a routine and a sense of stability, especially if those two things are suddenly missing from their lives. One of the ways that we can, as the person supporting the person with PTSD, one of the ways we can help them is, for example, to suggest doing things together, such as daily, taking a daily walk together at around the same time every day, or making and having dinner together in the evenings, again, at more or less the same time each day, if that's possible. By building routine into the life of the person with PTSD, it will send a subliminal message to them that they are safe. That, in turn, will help the person to rebuild their trust in their surroundings, which may have been lost due to the traumatizing event. And that event doesn't have to be a natural disaster. It could be someone who has just returned from war, for example. Another way to help the person with PTSD is to anticipate and understand triggers. So what is a trigger? It's a word that is being used a lot at the moment. But let me explain. So a trigger is something that is a reminder of the event for the traumatized person. That reminder has the effect of setting off PTSD symptoms. Those symptoms can come in a variety of forms, which might include flashbacks, alarm, fear, anxiety, tears, or a panic attack. Helpguide.org says that sometimes triggers are obvious. For example, a military veteran may be triggered by seeing his combat buddies or by loud noises that sound like gunfire. Some triggers, on the other hand, are less obvious. A piece of music or song may act as a trigger if, for example, it was playing at the time of the traumatizing event, or if a song is something that the traumatized person associates with the events that they went through. To give a personal example, after the hurricane, whenever a particular song came on on a playlist of mine, that would act as a trigger for me, not because it was playing at the time of the storm, but because it was a song that my group of friends and I had listened to a lot whilst we'd be at a party or whilst we'd be on the beach in the British Virgin Islands. I had come to associate that song with my friends and with being happy in their presence and company and with living in the BVI. So hearing that song come on after I was no longer with my friends, hearing that song would cause me to feel an immense sadness and it would quite often make me cry. 
And that would happen because it was a reminder of the hurricane and of no longer being with my friends who I miss so much and of no longer being in my home in BVI, missing BVI so much. I think the way I dealt with that, and this worked for me, but of course everyone is different. The way I dealt with that was that I didn't stop listening to that song. Instead, I listened to the song and I felt into the pain and the sadness. I allowed myself to sit and cry if that's what I needed to do. Whilst that worked for me, it may not be the best thing for everyone, especially if experiencing that triggering event is causing the person immense distress or worse, leading them to have suicidal thoughts. And if that is the case, they absolutely urgently need to seek professional help. Dealing with that trigger, listening to the song and sitting with the sensations, experiencing the memories, acted as a way for me of moving forward, of moving on, and eventually for feeling gratitude for having the friends I have and for having had the experiences that we shared together. Now when the song comes on, which it still does, it reminds me of those days on the beach and those times with my friends. It's a fond reminder. It's no longer an overwhelming sense of sadness that is being triggered inside me. And I think the way I got there was actually through seeking help from Jen, my clinical psychologist, who has helped me to deal with my PTSD symptoms. It's not something I achieved on my own without her professional help. So what can we do to help our loved one through those moments when they are being triggered? More often than not, we may not even realise that another person is experiencing a triggering event or moment. As happened with me, I would quietly have a panic attack whilst being asked questions about the hurricane. Even I didn't know what was going on, so nobody else could be expected to know. What's happening on the outside is quite often very subtle. But on the inside, the inner turmoil being felt by the person will be immense and it will be intense. If you are able to pick up on your loved one or friend experiencing a triggering moment, there are certain things you can do to help them see through that episode. Pete Walker, a psychotherapist in Berkeley, California, who specialises in complex PTSD, has a number of helpful tools for helping with PTSD symptoms. As the friend or loved one of the sufferer, we can help them with these tools. One of the tools suggested by Pete Walker is to gently tell your friend or loved one that they're having a flashback. This is likely to act as a stabilizing force, reminding them that what they're seeing is not happening to them in the present. One way of bringing them back to the present is to ask them to focus on their external surroundings. So if you're at home, you can try asking them to look around the room and describe what they see. If you're out and about, again gently ask them to look around and identify what they can see and what they can hear. Another tool is to come back to the body. I've talked about this at length on my other shows. I've discussed that one of the ways that I have been able to deal with my PTSD has been through exercises that take me out of my mind and back into my body. Breathing meditations have been wonderful for that as has ha having a regular yoga practice, going to the gym, and eating wholesome, nourishing food. You might want to try to encourage your friend, who may be experiencing a triggering moment, to take a few deep breaths slowly in and out, and whilst doing so, to focus, to think about, to feel how their breath feels as they breathe in and as they breathe out. And on the in-breath, invite them to fill their belly with the breath, and then to exhale slowly. And you could maybe ask them to repeat that two or three times, and that should help to stabilize and ground them. Another really important tool to help your friend is to remind them that it's okay to grieve. Pete Walker says of this, flashbacks are opportunities to release old, unexpressed feelings of fear and hurt, and that healthy grieving can turn our tears into self-compassion. I recall that the grieving part of the healing was something that I didn't do for a long time. Not because I couldn't or because I didn't have the opportunity. It was because I didn't allow myself to grieve. I didn't want to appear weak or desperate or needy or in some way inadequate and unable to cope with life. And so I put on the makeup, I masked over the grief with a brave face and I carried on. And I carried on until I couldn't carry on anymore until I had a breakdown on the one year anniversary of Hurricane Irma, until I felt feelings making me no longer want to be alive. 
I felt shame for not being more grateful to be alive and I felt shame for having the feelings of sadness, overwhelm and depression that I had. And all of that stopped me properly from grieving for what had happened, for the life that I'd been pulled away from before I was ready to leave it. I see now that not grieving sooner was for me a big, big mistake. So encouraging your friend or loved one to grieve will help with their healing process. Another thing to be mindful of is the importance of being tactful. The importance of tact. I think the best way for me to describe what I mean by this is to do so by way of example. And I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, so bear with me. One of the things that I haven't spoken about yet on my show to do with the hurricane experience is that whilst living in the British Virgin Islands, I had gone to the Humane Society there and picked up a couple of cats, Bruce and his mother Lima. The primary reason these cats were now a part of my household is that I had rats, rats running around inside my wooden house, which clearly had holes in it. Yes, rats, huge, huge rats and a whole family of them. Unbeknownst to me, they had been living with me, sharing my house with me for around two months from the time that I moved into that house. And then one day as I was making breakfast, I saw a humongous rat run across me right in front of me inside my house. Of course, I screamed very loudly and the poor rat was probably deafened for life. I packed a bag, went down the hill to Road Town and checked into the cheapest hotel I could find as soon as I could find it. And there I stayed for a week pondering what to do. As far as I could see it, I had three options. Option one, go back to England, tail between legs because of a family of rats. I'm not dramatic at all. No, no, listeners, not me, dramatic. Option two, move out of the beautiful wooden home with holes in it and move into a sealed apartment, because of course sealed buildings exist everywhere. Option three, the wild card option, get cats. I had read somewhere that ancient Egyptians had used cats as ratters. I'd had an affinity with ancient Egypt since I visited there when I was 18 years old. And so I thought, I thought if cats as ratters were good enough for the Egyptians, this ancient civilization, which had clearly achieved so much, then cats would be good enough for me. So off I went to the shelter and eventually came back with Bruce and Lima. They worked outside five to six days a week, roaming the exterior of the house, doing their ratting. And then one to two days of the week, they would officially work at home, where I'd leave them inside the house to take care of any issues, as it were, inside. It worked a treat. No more rats. At least not for a while, but that's a a whole other story. So here I am, living in this mixed species household. My cat's nine to five job is ratting. They come home at night, and we all cosy up and cuddle together in the evenings. I went very, very, very quickly from being not a cat person at all, to full on and proud, crazy cat lady. To the point where people I didn't even know would come up to me in town and ask if I was the owner of the cats known as Bruce and Lima. So this went on for a year. And I think that with each passing day, I really did start to love Bruce and to love Lima more and more. And I could see they were getting closer to me as well. Then Hurricane Irma lands. The group with whom I was seeing out the storm, we together had with us my two cats, another cat and two dogs. On day five after the storm, we learnt that we would likely be on an evacuation flight out of the BVI the following day. Except there was one major problem. None of the flights that we were able to get on were accepting pets. And it slowly dawned on me that if I evacuated, I would have to leave my cats behind at which point I was going to stay. On my own, I wasn't going to leave the cats. For those of you who tuned into my first show, you may recall that the personal safety situation was very quickly going south on the island. A few days prior to us being able to evacuate, we had been threatened with looting, and that was a threat that we took very, very seriously. So there I was, unable to take my cats with me and wanting to stay behind. And you can probably guess that my friends talked me out of this and I was persuaded to leave, not least because of the immense danger to life as we knew it that was presenting itself as a greater daily threat. So I had to decide, decide what to do with my cats. The only real choice available was to let them go free. So 
That evening, I sat with Bruce and I sat with Lima and I held them like I had never held them before. Crying, sobbing, apologising to them over and over again for letting them down. You see, I'd made a promise to them the day I rescued them from the shelter. The day I got them, I said to them, I will look after you until the day you die. I will never let you fall. And here I was, abandoning them to their fate, letting them down, letting them fall. The very things I had promised them that I would never, ever do. And if everything else that had happened during the hurricane experience wasn't traumatic enough, I think this was most certainly the tipping point. I spent most of the next, oh, I don't know, probably 14 days or so going through fits of crying and blubbering and generally being an inconsolable wreck. How does all of this relate to being tactful with a loved one or friend suffering from PTSD? I'll tell you. In the months after evacuating the British Virgin Islands and staying with Sally on the island off the UK, the cats were still in BVI. Thankfully, as a result of some last-minute thinking and great, great fortune, one of the people in our group, who was a vet, realised he had the key to the vet's practice. And so on our way to the airport, we left all of the animals inside the practice hoping that someone would be able to rehome them or that people who stayed on island would come and take these animals, perhaps as their ratters, with rats being quite an issue after the storm. And that's exactly what happened. As I found out a little while later, Bruce and Lima were taken to another of the islands, a smaller one, where they could be ratters, as that island was experiencing a big rodent problem. Except that whilst Bruce, the showman of the two, was alive and well and accounted for, and by all accounts living his best life on a private island just off Tortola in BVI, Lima had gone missing. Lima is partially sighted, you see, and very fearful, especially of other animals and and in particular of dogs. On the boat that took Bruce and Lima to the other island, there was a dog also being taken over. I was told later that as soon as the boat docked, the dog approached Lima, perhaps out of curiosity. Lima got scared and ran away, and that was the last that anyone saw of her for some time. Now, By this time I was jobless, looking for work for half of each day and looking for my cats for the other half of each day. BVI being five hours behind where I was, this timing worked perfectly. I think I may have mentioned on one of my previous shows that I can be pretty pig-headed when I want or need to be, or perhaps that's called determination. You see, I was determined to get my cats back and to find Lima notwithstanding that the British Virgin Islands were essentially broken in the months immediately after the storm. And notwithstanding the extreme, extreme hardships and difficulties that those who remained there were facing, beautiful, kind, gentle people were helping me and others to reunite with their animals, people who had also had to leave without their pets. As part of this, a couple of my friends who owned a boat were going to take me over to that little island And I was going to walk every single centimetre of that island until I found Lima. The plan was going to get actioned as soon as BVI started allowing commercial visitors back in. I no longer had a work permit, so I'd have to wait until tourists were allowed back in to get in that way. Whilst all of this was going on, and this was going on for some months, I was making my wild plans, going through maps of the islands, working out logistics. Not one of my friends... Not one of my friends said what I think they were probably all thinking. None of them said to me, Hey, hey, Lima is probably no longer with us. Lima has probably died. You need to stop this now. Because, you see, in my traumatised mind, there was absolutely no way that Lima could be dead. I mean, she was a cat. She could hunt. I knew in my heart that she wanted to come home, to be reunited with me, as crazy as that might sound. And then one of my friends, towards the end of 2017, as we were putting the January 2018 invade the island to find Lima plan into place, he very, very gently said to me, it's great that you want to do this, and I think you have a solid plan, but I just want to say, I just want to say to you that I don't want you to be upset. I just want to say that you need to be prepared for her not coming back with you. My friend said to me, You may be coming back with just Bruce. Lima may not have made it. And it was in that moment I realised, I realised what all of my friends had realised months before me. 
And it was also in those moments I realised just how much they had been protecting me. Protecting me from myself. Protecting me from experiencing any further pain and hurt and grief. And in that moment, I was so, so grateful to them. So grateful when I realised what they were all doing. I think to them I was living in a fantasy world, and to any bystander it would be a fantasy world, even though it turned out to be true and everyone was fine in the end. Well, the cats were. But it was a world that they didn't want to crush, as it would have caused me even more distress. In fact, Sally, my friend with whom I was living at the time, said to me months afterwards, she said, all of those times you were talking about going to get Lima, I didn't want to say this to you. I didn't want to say this, but I thought she was no longer there. I thought she was dead, but I just couldn't say that to you. My other friend, who so tactically and diplomatically told me that Lima may no longer be there to bring home, did so with so much tact and compassion that I'm so grateful to him for that. In the event, and only because of the amazing steps that friends, acquaintances and complete strangers took to find and look after Bruce and Lima, only because of that, they returned. Another of the many miracles came when the day before the managers of this little island were due to leave permanently, only the day before their departure did Lima suddenly appear. I think she just walked right through their door and into the house. The husband of the couple managing the island held Lima up in the mirror and took a photo. That photo somehow landed in my messenger and there she was. She was there in the arms of this kind man and she was looking plump and well fed. And those beautiful kind people took Bruce and Lima back with them on the boat to Tortola. The cats were taken to the vet's practice. They were jabbed for rabies and microchipped. And then yet more beautiful, kind people gave the cats passage to me. They went from BVI to Antigua on a private charter plane, which was hilarious. They then flew on the British Airways flight from Antigua to Gatwick, and I went back up to England to collect them at Gatwick Airport. And there they were, plump and very happy to see me, and I was so, so happy to see them. The lady at Gatwick Airport, managing the airport animal centre, said to me that for the last three and a half months, That's how long it had been since I'd seen my cats last. The lady said that for the last three and a half months, she had seen emotional reunion after emotional reunion between those who had been through Hurricane Irma when collecting their pets. She even said that Bruce and Lima's story, which she had somehow come to know about, was one of the more remarkable ones, and that she was even looking forward to meeting them as a result. So, hmm, the importance of tact the importance of tact. Without that immense display of tact and diplomacy displayed by all of my friends and my parents, with me broken as I was at that point, I think the state of my mental health would have become so much worse if I'd been confronted earlier with either the very real possibility that Bruce couldn't come home to me due to logistical impossibilities or that Lima couldn't come home to me because she hadn't made it. So, I cannot emphasise enough the importance of tact in a situation like that. And of course there comes a point when someone's fantasy has to be dealt with, and again everyone is different, so someone else may respond better to a different way. But for me, being gently told by my friend that I should be prepared to bring back one cat and be prepared for the loss of a cat, that gentle, tactful reminder given to me at just the right time is what I needed to hear. If you, as the person helping your friend or relative, are feeling overwhelmed, you need to prioritise. And you need to prioritise yourself. There are a number of ways of doing that. One of the things that you can do is to take a break. Go on a short trip somewhere to clear your mind, to clear your head and have a change of scenery, even if that's just for a day on a day trip. Another great thing you can do is to seek out a therapist and talk to them about your situation or lean on another friend, perhaps even a mutual friend of the person you're helping. And then you and that mutual friend can help each other and also help your friend who is suffering from PTSD and do that together. Another great thing to do is to gently encourage your friend who is suffering from PTSD to seek out professional help themselves if they haven't done so already. And help doesn't necessarily need to be in the sense of seeing a doctor or a therapist. 
Well, I do totally encourage either or both of those things because they helped me immensely. I also wholeheartedly encourage what we in society now call holistic therapies, not necessarily as an alternative to something such as seeing a doctor, but often as an add-on. One of the modalities I turned to after Hurricane Irma, and I've spoken about this previously, is that I sought out Reiki healing. Reiki is a form of energy healing based on teachings given to Dr. Usui in Japan a hundred years ago. Those teachings were taken to the US and the wider Western world by Madame Takata, a Hawaiian lady. Reiki is an energy healing technique which promotes relaxation, reduces stress and anxiety, and is now widely available in hospitals in North America. Other healing modalities that I've used and continue to use are breathing meditations, guided meditations, and just meditating with calming, peaceful music playing in the background. I also recommend a gentle yoga practice to help you come back to your body. And if you're a fitness freak like me, then full-on gym sessions or classes are a great way to stabilize and balance your mood, as well as to enhance your mood. Another great way of looking after ourselves is to eat as healthy and a balanced diet as we possibly can. And if time is limited, which it is for most of us, try to prep meals over the weekend for the week ahead, which you can keep fresh in the fridge or freezer. And whilst may, this may seem like time out of your weekend, time that you'd rather spend doing other things, the more we do this food prep, the quicker we get at it. And I speak from personal experience on this. The easier it becomes to throw together a few healthy meals and bang them in the fridge or the freezer, ready for the week ahead. Because you see, by pre-preparing meals, by taking the time out to properly nourish our bodies, we are sending our brains a subliminal message that we matter that ultimately we have respect for ourselves. And by having self-respect, our sense of self-worth develops, it increases, and that is so incredibly powering. Something else I saw recently, and I came across it on a website called wondermind.com, which I highly recommend you taking a look at. That's wondermind.com. What I saw on there was that by making a go-to playlist of songs or music generally that makes us feel good, by putting that on and listening to it, that can have an instant mood-boosting effect. My favourite go-to playlists and albums are ones that include mantra music, which are melodies containing ancient, often Sanskrit mantras that have almost immediate mood-lifting capabilities. It all sounds very serious when I say it like this, but I invite you to give it a try. Search for mantra music on your music app and just give it a go. It might not be for you, but I invite you to at least give it a try. Another thing on wondermind.com is the oft-heard advice about limiting our scrolling on social media. And this is something I have spoken about on a past show. I spoke about limiting social media use in the context of it being a time zapper and of it being a way of taking us away from the things that we're committed to, things that really matter to us, such as working on a project or spending time with the people we care about. Another aspect of social media and how it can be harmful is that the energy that comes from the negative content, which is sometimes on there, is not something that's beneficial to us. And depending on what kinds of accounts we're following, it's very tempting to scroll through those accounts and start comparing ourselves and our lives to others. By comparing ourselves to others, we're subliminally telling ourselves that we're not good enough and things are not good enough for us. We might compare how we look, for example, or where we live or the holiday that we went on. And someone else's amazing photos of each of these things may make us feel inadequate or anxious or depressed. So limiting the scrolling is key to all of this, as is remembering that a photo can actually tell a thousand lies in that it's just a photo. It's a photo of a moment. It's only a snapshot of an entire 24-hour day, of an entire week, month, an entire life. It's only ever a snapshot of someone's entire existence. And I've actually been told by friends that sometimes people will take a photo somewhere sometimes around between 10 to 50 times to get the one that they want to post. So we need to stop scrolling and to stop comparing our lives and ourselves to other people. And that way we avoid feeling bad or anxious or depressed. And overall, managing our stress and being patient with ourselves and with our loved ones are two very important aspects of taking care of a loved one or friend who has PTSD. 
Having spoken as I have on this show about all the help that I received when I was going through my PTSD challenges, all the people who were there for me, I want to say thank you to you all. Without you, my experience would have been a lot worse. And as part of that, I want to dedicate this show to my dear, dear friend, Sally French. Sally, you almost single-handedly got me through those dreadful first six months or so post-Hurricane Irma, and I still don't know how you did it. And I still can't actually talk to you about it in person without tearing up. You'll recall I tried to do that over lunch back in Vegas earlier this year. I tried to talk to you and I just kept tearing up. But just know that I am forever grateful to you, my dear, dear friend Sally. If anyone listening to this show has been affected by any of the issues that I've raised, please, please seek out help, whether that's talking to a friend or speaking with someone who can offer professional guidance. On Island here in the Cayman Islands, we have a number of excellent resources that you can reach out to. Infinite Mind Care, which provides counselling services, can be reached on 926 0882 and the Alex Panton Foundation. Their details can be found at alexpantonfoundation.ky and they offer support to people up to the age of 30. Loud Silent Voices provides mental health support too. Their number is 922-3847 and their email is info at lsv.support. Thank you all so much for listening. If you liked my show, if you're enjoying my shows generally, then please do tell a friend. Get your friends involved in the discussion. And as part of that, if any of you want to reach out to me to give me feedback, thoughts, comments, criticisms, suggestions for topics, anything, please reach out. You can get me at shuvradeb82 at gmail.com. And that's spelt S-H-U-V-R-A-D-E-B, the numbers 82 at gmail.com. And remember, whatever your struggles might be, may you always remember you are never alone. Thank you so much for listening. See you here again next Thursday and every Thursday at 2pm right here on Bobo FM 89.1. Bye for now. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for listening to Shuvra Deb with you. And please do tune in every Thursday at 2pm on Bobo FM 89.1 for more topics related to and relevant to mental health. If any of you would like to reach out to me directly about any of the issues I've discussed, please do email me at shuvradeb82 at gmail.com. That's spelt S-H-U-V-R-A-D-E-B. The numbers 82 at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening.